supposed to count forward or backward? All right. You can go ahead and start, yeah. I believe we are live. So welcome everybody to our August 12th edition of the Coach's Corner. Uh, we've got uh, Mark Camaso uh, on the West Coast, San Francisco area. Jason Rush, uh, also West Coast, uh, Phoenix, Arizona area. And myself, Greg Eisen on the opposite coast, uh, the East Coast here in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Um, we're, we're really leaving the uh, middle of the country kind of bare, aren't we? We are. We are. We're coast to coast. Flew right over. Yeah. 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 So we, we have found these coaches' corners to, um, to provide some value to our community, to our viewers. Um, and uh, we are thrilled to continue to do so. The coaches on this panel and all the coaches on our team uh, have a unique perspective. Um, we get a chance to, uh, to see how all sorts of different businesses operate and function and how they are managing through these times. Uh, and uh, a format like this where we can share some of those experiences um, seems to be really beneficial. So we're thrilled to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to let Mark and Jason give a little background. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into this uh, a little more. Mark, you want to start us off? Sure, we should uh, remind everybody that um, <clears throat> you know, if you have questions, if you're on here in Zoom, if you have questions, you put them in the Q&A section. If you're on Facebook Live, go ahead and post them there. We do have somebody monitoring those. So as those questions come up, we love to answer the questions that come from the audience. Uh, you know, uh, Jason and, and Greg and I get to spend uh, a lot of t Zoom time together. Uh, we love it but we'd love to uh, specifically answer questions if those people are out there that, that have them. So please put them in there. Uh, quick, uh, yeah, you, you mentioned it, uh, Greg, I'm out on the West Coast, uh, San Francisco. Um, get to see uh, a lot of <clears throat> technology companies out here, but lots of different ones uh, across the, the US that I get to interact with uh, as well. Um, really, you know, my focus is on, uh, as we've all talked about before, my focus is, is looking at how can we help organizations and people be better and, uh, you know, doing that through the scaling up process and, you know, really looking at uh, how do the teams themselves manage through what is arguably some tough times right now. I know we've got some questions around that. I uh, look forward to uh, John with you guys. So, Jason, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, so, uh, you guys are in pleasant places right now. I'm just trying to survive the, uh, the heat. We've, this is our Phoenix's hottest summer ever. Uh, in recorded history, so it's been uh, it's been toasted. We've had more days of uh, 100 plus 10 uh, than ever before, so it's been toasty. So I'm happy to be inside where it's a little bit cooler, and uh, you know, kind of like Mark said, you know, we're helping businesses, helping teams. You know, I always think of it as you know, with when we start working with the owners, you know, do they? I always ask the question, do you have the business you want? And the answer usually is no. So it's really a focus of us is to help people take the business that they have and turn them into the business that they actually want and what they're looking for out of the business. Uh, today I was working with a company where we started with the, uh, about two and a half years ago. And the owner said, basically, the one thing he wants to do is get out of the day-to-day -day operations. And he finally said today, he goes, I'm going to be out of the day-to-day -day operations probably the next month. And it took a while uh, for him to develop the right team. Sometimes these things take a little longer than you'd like. Uh, but he finally got what he actually wants and, and the goals that he's looking for. So it's a process. It works. Just that's what we're here to help you do. Yes. Thank you, guys. And, um, you know, both Mark, Jason and myself uh, come to you with 20 plus years of experience, each having started, built, bought, sold numerous businesses from technology companies to financial uh, companies to photography companies and uh, a number of other businesses in between. So we like to think that we've been there and done that uh, to some extent uh, and have some wisdom or at least some ideas uh, to share with you folks. Um, or, or a lot of scars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's for sure. That's for sure. That's yeah. the best way to learn. Nice. Um, so what we're going to do here is uh, we've asked our community uh, to provide some questions in advance. And uh, I've put them on index cards and put them in a bin here. And we're going to pull some of these questions out, uh, potluck questions, and uh, uh, I'll read them and then we'll get some responses from, from the panel here. And then as Mark mentioned, please feel free to add some live questions into that chat function and we can address those as we go as, we go as well. All right, so let's see here. Let's pick our first question out of the box here. 
All right, so it says Q4 is coming up. Can we really do any strategic planning for 2021 when so many things are so uncertain? Who wants to take that one first? Um, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look, now we're go both ahead. jumping in. I was going to say, go I, was gonna go say I heard a, gr a great one from my good friend, Jason Rush, the gentleman to my left, uh, the other day say, yeah, no, we can't. So, you know, just uh, pack up shop, give everybody a stapler and be done. So no, no planning. <laughs> so with that, Jason, what do you think? Uh, with that, I think that's probably the most important time to do planning. And I, th I think it's important to look down the field and really where you want your business to be. Things have changed and your, your outlook might have changed, but that doesn't mean you stop planning and start preparing for the future and what it looks like. Um, look at your products, look at your offerings, look at your services, look how you're structured, look at all these different things and think long-term. You know, people are kind of, I hear people say, well, when this is over, and I look back and go, I don't know that this is over. Uh, I think there's gonna be parts that will go back to maybe the way it was, but I, there's gonna be a large part of this that is not gonna go back. Uh, working from home, I think is going to be here for a long time, if not permanently. Um, people, you know, protecting themselves in different ways, health-wise, I think is going to be here for a long, long time. Uh, changes in manufacturing process to keep people safe is going to be here for a long time. All these different things are, are that, that started that people have found like, wow, this is really actually working better in certain ways. So, you know, I, I look at, you know, when people say, well, it's uh, when this is over, I say no. Look at your business, look at what you're doing, think about where you really want your business to be and how you can adjust your business to be there. And it's important more than ever to give everybody a plan. Um, you know, one of the things is that people need something to focus on and giving them direction, giving them goals, giving them priorities and where they can spend their time helping to move the business forward will certainly do that. That's why strategic planning is more important, I, I believe, than ever. Sure. Mark, sure. what were we gonna say, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I'll, I'll carry off or go where you kind of took us there, Jason, because I agree with you, which is, yeah, you know, people need a vision and a plan to get there, right? And so strategic planning is about, you know, especially as leadership, right, is saying, hey, uh, we are going to put a destination in the future out there for all of us uh, to the best that we can. You know, I, I think some of the other questions that will, will come in, I know that have been thrown in, are, you know, how might you go about doing some of that? And we might be doing it a little differently now because things are, you know, unknown. But, you know, put, getting a plan out there, people, your teams are looking for that. It doesn't mean you have to say, hey, it's going to be great, right, and, and lie about it. Um, we don't need to – we also don't need to be, you know, those perfect posters on the wall that you just think positive everything's going to happen. Um, but saying, hey, here's a plan that we're going to uh, put out into the future, and then we're going to measure against it as we go through. And more than likely, and I know I've been doing this with the, the companies I've been working with, is we're pulse checking faster. Right. In the past, we might have pulse checked in a quarterly basis against the strategic plan for a year. And now, you know, I, people are pulse checking a lot faster. Maybe it's a month. Maybe it's two weeks. I don't know. Um, but figure out what cadence is right to see if you're on that path and then adapt along the way. Right. That is strategic planning. It doesn't mean you have to say, oh, we're going to this place. And if we don't get there, well, we're you know done and take your stapler. It's hey, OK, things changed. Um, let's, you know, reassess and redo uh, and maybe do that a little bit sooner than you might have in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? and, and the only thing that I'll add to, to those comments that I fully agree with is, is it's been my observation, um, and I'm generalizing a bit, but it's been my observation that the, the three kinds of people um, in this current environment, um, there are those that are in denial, um, and you see them all the time. You see them on the uh, TV and otherwise. Uh, there are those that are in a wait and see mode. Um, they simply are waiting for it to go away. It'll end. Let's just get through it. Let's wait and see. And then there are people that are on attack. Um, and uh, obviously we subscribe to those people that are on attack, even if you have to adapt and adjust more frequently to Jason and Mark's point. Um, people need to be aiming at something. When you aim at nothing, you hit it with remarkable accuracy. Right, so we need to be hit. We need to be aiming at things. Our people need to be aiming at things. Um, so I agree fully with my colleagues here. Uh, let me grab another question. All right, let's see what we got next. <laughs> this is fun. Uh, all right. Um, okay. So, given the uncertainties in government stimulus programs, 
What are you seeing businesses do related to their cash and financial reserves, debt, investments, M&A, credit lines, et cetera? In other words, how are you, pe- how are you seeing people treating um, cash in this environment? Mark, I'll let you Craig, you're a finance. Oh, okay, I'll go. I'll go. Um, you know, yeah, I think that as we look at it, as we sit today on on August 12th, right? Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of question marks on government stimulus. Uh, you know, whether there's going to be a second round, or well, what would really be technically a fourth round, um, or um, other things or not. You know. Uh, much like you just mentioned, Greg, there are people that, you know, will be in denial. There are going to be people that kind of sit and wait, and then there are going to be people, people that are saying, hey, I'm going to, you know, deal with what I have here, but move, right, do something. And I think on the cash front, uh, you know, it is, you know, cash is going to be king. Uh, you need to be uh, smart about what, uh, you know, what what you have in the bank. Uh, and look at, um, you know, where can I make sure that I shore up those um, reserves. I mean, you know, the old saying for, for getting uh, cash reserves is that, uh, you know, you don't want to be desperate for it because you will not get it uh, if you're desperate for it. So do that earlier. Do it when you don't need it uh, and be smart about that. You know, um, you know look at uh, if you can get a line of credit right now from your bank, you should be looking at that. If you have a good business that can sustain that, you know how to use debt uh, as a tool, then you know, look at that uh, because the credit markets are going to get tighter and tighter. Uh, we've already started to see it. Um, you, you know, look at those things. You should, I, I know, Jason, you're, you're a big proponent of this. You should have a really good relationship with your banker. You should have already set that up in the past. If you yeah. don't, start now. Share where you're at. Share that you might have had a tough time through corona, right, and what's going on. But here's what you're doing and here's what you've seen. That's what bankers are looking for. They're not looking for people who are hiding that then come out and go, oh, I'm out of money, right? That, that, that just scares them. And, you know, bankers are, if anything, they are risk averse, right? They want to get their money back with a little bit of interest. That's how they live. So show them ahead of time that, hey, this is what we're doing. We'd like a little bit of reserves uh, and get those in place. That's one option, right? There's mergers, there's other things that are possible. And if a stimulus package comes, then look at how you might use that as, uh, as an augment to the other things you're doing. Don't make it a, a one trick pony. Yeah, I agree. As a, as a reform banker uh, in my, <laughs> as they always say in my, my previous life, the, the biggest thing you can do is to over communicate with your banker, especially in, in these times right now. Um, many of the companies I've worked with who have had challenging times, it's been the fact that they've communicated and we stress this and over and over again about where they are and what's happening uh, to be really key. So if you've got a banking relationship, build on that by communicating. Um, don't keep them the quiet, let them know what's happening. Um, and that'll keep things typically a little bit at bay. Uh, if they feel comfortable with where you are, they will listen to you a lot more than if you, you would kind of disappear. You know, one of the things that is most important at this time is having cash and access to cash. So if you are thinking about, you know, like maybe I could expand my line of credit, it's a perfect time to go for it, right? Because as Mark said, banks are great at lending money when you don't need it. They're terrible at lending money when you actually need it. There's options, you know, you can go down the line from banks to finance companies to factors. So there's, there's typically a lot of different, you know, and those, depending on your situation, it can get expensive, might not be worth it. But start thinking about those things today of what you need and what to build that cash and that cash reserve. Once again, manage, continue to manage your expenses. Sort of a lot of the messaging we've had. There's a lot of government grants out there besides all of the, you know, the talks about the EIDL and the Main Street Lending Program. Uh, states also have special grants, uh, same with some cities. So look at those in your community and for uh, possible uh, financing options. And then continually, you know, you check back with us all the time because we're, we're working it all the time to know what programs are out there so that we can help you um, to find those options for you to make sure you have the cash on hand. Because uh, cash, as they say, is cash is king. It is absolutely paramount uh, during these times. You know, I'll, I'll just add that having been around entrepreneurship and small business entrepreneurship for 46 years, one of the things that I've noticed uh, is most small business owners notoriously are um, limited in their financial acumen. They may understand their P&L, but they often don't understand their balance sheet 
or their cash flow statements, truly understand their cash flow statements. And they end up getting in big trouble as a result of that. So I would just say, I would want just reinforce that if you're one of those people, get in touch with your cash flow statements. If you are not receiving cash flow statements every week, if not every day for some people, uh, and understand what the forecast is for the next week, what the balance is, what things look like, um, uh, I would really encourage you to do so. And, and then on top of that, if you're not doing contingency planning, if you're not running forecasts six, 12, 18 months out to give you an indicator for what your cash situation looks like uh, in a high, medium, or low projection or a set of assumptions, I think you're missing an opportunity there too, right? You, you need to plan for the worst and hope for the best uh, and to Mark and Jason's point, you need cash for all of that and you need to know where you stand. Um, so hopefully that helps. Okay, let's jump uh, to another question here. All right, shake it up. <laughs> Mix up the box. Okay, I like this one, uh, a little softer. Um, what are you guys seeing to be the most important characteristics needed of today's leaders? I could jump in first Jason there. Yeah, I, okay, I, I, Craig, go. I have some thoughts, but go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with a, with a quick one first. Um, uh, to me, in my observation, there is absolutely nothing more important than empathy. And empathy has always been important, uh, you know, but I think it's more important than ever before. Folks are dealing with all sorts of personal and professional issues in these environments. And it's those empathetic leaders that are truly listening and caring about their teams, about their people that are gonna win, uh, win the favor, win the day, win the loyalty uh, of their constituents. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, geez, we gotta be more decisive than ever before, right? We need to make decisions quickly. Um, and many of us struggle with decisiveness. Um, we need to get better at that. Um, and uh, we could probably talk about lots of tricks and tools for, for doing that as well. Um, but those are the two things that come to my mind, empathy and decisiveness. Jason, what are you thinking? I was going with the, uh, I was going right with you with the empathy. I think understanding right now is uh, understanding your team and understanding what's going on and feeling that is far more important um, than ever. Sometimes I hear, things like, oh, the owner of the company is tone deaf. This is the wrong time to be tone deaf. This is the right time to hear your team and listen and react to what they're saying. So that, that decisiveness is extremely important. I also think it's important to be very focused through that. And that becomes like, what's the plan? Um, people are looking, they'll go where you point them. They just need to know where they're going. And so just like we will say, you know, you're not gonna get on a plane if you don't know where it's flying to. It's the same thing. People, are, people will buy in if you have a plan and you understand where you're going. It doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. It just means that you have a, your hand on the wheel and that you're taking people in a direction. And so making sure that that is clear and clearly stated, right, is to me is one of the most fundamental things you have to do um, because people need that direction. People need the direction. Mark? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think, you know, uh, you know, the characteristics uh, that, you know, I, I think the one that comes to mind, uh, I got a couple, but the one really that hit me first was compassion, right? It's compassion for, you know, what's going on uh, as a leader, right? That doesn't mean that, that we can't lead. I think leading compassionately is the, you know, the, the strongest thing a good leader can do uh, is to understand that their team's uh, and the people around them and their customers and their vendors and their investors uh, are all human beings. So how can we be compassionate in our leadership? Yes, we have to make decisions, uh, but we can make those decisions in light of, hey, you know what? Here's what we know. Here's what's going on. Here's what I understand. Here's what I understand is going on for others. And this is how we're going to move forward. You know, Jason, to your point, where's that place that we're going on uh, doing it? So, but doing that compassionately, uh, I think, is really important right now. Uh, people are looking for that. They, quite frankly, I think they're um, just really jonesing for it, uh, especially in this you know time where you know we can't be in you know offices together. You don't get any of that interpersonal stuff, uh, or you don't get as much. And so, how can you, we as leaders be compassionate, 
I also think that uh, another characteristic needs to be resilience, right? How do you uh, understand that, you know, there's going to be challenges that are outside of our control uh, in our business, in our marketplace, um, in our personal lives and worlds? How do we, you know, dust ourselves up, uh, uh, dust ourselves off and, and get back up and, you know, say, hey, you know what, uh, that's part of this process uh, altogether. So compassion, um, you know, resilience, leadership, I think those are all strong characteristics that will go a long way in, in the current era. Following up with that, um, there are many people who struggle with decisiveness, uh, understandably so. And um, I'm sure that you guys have seen, you know, tips and tricks for how folks can be more decisive. What, what comes to mind? Uh, what, what wisdom can you share with the viewership on how, to, how do you become more decisive? In my mind, to become more decisive is understanding the outcome that you're looking for. Uh, and so it, it becomes, if you understand the goal, you, want, you keep that in your forefront of your mind. And it helps you to understand where you need to go. And with that, it, it allows, if you understand the direction of where you're going, it allows you to take different routes, right? So if you're going somewhere and there needs to be a change of route, um, they can occur because once again, you understand the end point. So it's when people aren't sure what their goals are, when they're not sure what that destination looks like, that's where it becomes hard to become decisive. But if I know exactly where I'm going, it's easy. I'll use the plane reference again. If I'm gonna get on a plane, I'm gonna go visit Mark in San Francisco. That doesn't mean the, the pilot will set a flight, they'll have a, they'll have a path, but that doesn't mean that's necessarily the path they directly follow. They will go off that path, but they're still gonna hit their, their destination. It's the same thing. You have to allow for that variability, but if you don't understand the, the, the end point, it's hard to be decisive. Great. Mark, what about you? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I think that um, you know, decisiveness uh, um, becomes uh, stronger when you, you know, I mean, I do agree with Jason, when you know where your destination is, but the example I'm going to use is, is one that, that we, you know, use with our, our member companies, you know, around their, their customers and, the, and their marketplaces and knowing, you know, you can be very decisive on whether you want to, you know, uh, respond to somebody's request to you or not, if you know if they fit in the right sandbox and or the right core customer model. And so, uh, you know, I think decisiveness all around comes when you're very comfortable and confident in who and what you are, whether that's as an individual or as a business, right? If you understand, I'm just using the example on the business side of, hey, this is the sandbox we play in, right? We know that if it's this, you know, within this, it could be geography, it could be this marketplace, whatever it is, then when somebody comes and asks you if you can do something for them and they're outside of that, it's easy to be decisive. You know, that's not something that we do well at. This is, so we appreciate the offer, but hey, maybe you even say there's somebody we know that does it better, uh, go over here. Uh, same thing is true on that core customer, right? The makeup of who that might be, whether it's, uh, you know, psychographic modeling or where, however you might do it. Um, but I, again, I think decisiveness comes when you're really comfortable and confident in who and what you are and, and know why, right? Yeah. Uh, you kind of go to that Simon Sinek, uh, don't do the what, but go to the why, right? What we do is this, but why we do it is, you know, that's the core. And if you can get there and know that, decisions are a lot easier. I mean, easier, I didn't say easy, but easier if you get that. So many people are just like, oh, we're gonna be everything to everybody. If I could sell moccasins, that's great, or a, a technology product, but I'll just go everywhere. And that's how you be indecisive. And the, the other piece to that is um, decisiveness is often constrained um, for fear of failure. Right, folks are afraid to make a mistake, and that's why they're unable to be decisive. And geez, um, all I can say is that uh, we're all making lots of mistakes in this new world, in this new environment, and um, it's those that are comfortable making mistakes, comfortable with failure, because they recognize that's the best opportunity to learn and grow, uh, are those that are uh, able to be more decisive. Right. I like to use the, the cliche progress over perfection, right? We don't need to be perfect. You don't have to worry about getting it just right. What you need to do is act and, pro and, and have some progress and move and, and learn. Uh, and you'll figure out most of the stuff along the way. That, that's been my experience. Great points, guys. Okay, let's grab another question here. 
And we did have we did have somebody uh, just so you know Matthew uh, uh, from the in the chat who's asking if they all have to come out of the box here and Matthew no they don't have to come out of the box uh, just ask some questions and we're happy to to answer them on on live so ask away absolutely all right so I've got another question here it says why can't my team just get over it uh, and move on with doing the tasks that are needed to get done so what do we think about that guys. Uh, I'll take this one. Um, you know, it's kind of related to some of the characteristics stuff we talk about, but I, I think um, one of the things that um, as leaders we need to recognize, uh, we talked about this, we had a uh, Petra Forum group, with, uh, a small group of, of our member leaders that come together on a, a regular basis, uh, and, and we talked about this a little bit, but I, I think that as leaders we've got to recognize that this, there's a two-pronged challenge we have going on right now. It, it's always existed, but in, in headier times when things are, are better, um, it's easier to overlook uh, one of these. What it is, is from my perspective, is I, I call it having a head and a heart challenge, meaning that the, you know, the head challenges in business right now are, you know, where's our marketplace? What's going on? How are we going to make sure we, you know, keep enough cash reserves? How are we, those are all head challenges, right? How do you address those? What processes can you come up with? What, you know, lines of credit can you get? Those are all things that you can attack and create a solution for. The heart challenges are the ones uh, that are the softer stuff. It is kind of those characteristics we talked about. Um, but I think part of it is, is when as leaders, some of what we do as leaders in our companies is we can kind of quote unquote, I think you said, Greg, get over it, right? We get over it because we can process all the data that's coming in. We're seeing a lot of this stuff. We know what's going on in the business. We know where things are. We know what customers are, you know, doing well for us. We, you know, what employees may be challenging or not. Um, so we're able to process a lot of that and our team members don't have all that data. And so I think the heart pro challenge, not problem, the heart challenge is, um, kind of being real with our teams, right? Mm -hmm. So getting over it is saying, hey, you know what? We, under, you know, we as leadership or as a leader, I understand that it may be challenging. And, you know, I want you to know there is a direction, you know, all these things tie together, right? Here's what our strategic direction is for the year, but I know it may be challenging for you. Uh, and if you know that someone in particular is challenged by something, you know, maybe they've got a family member that's sick or, you know, they've got a child at home that, you know, all of us, you know, anybody who's got kids knows that uh, homeschooling right now is a, uh, you know, Jason, you've got a couple, right? It's, that's a cluster. So if you know that as a leader, I, I think, you know, how do you, how do you expect somebody to just get over the fact that they feel like they're failing their kids? They can't get over that. You have to, I think, address it and call it out. And so attacking that heart challenge with, uh, you know, again, compassion and some understanding and communicating that, Hey, um, let's see what we can do to, um, make it a little bit better and still address the head challenges of we need to move forward. We need to go towards this goal. We need to shore up our cash position, all those things. Yeah. I, I would, I would kind of come back to the, you know, something you said earlier is about the why. If you if your team isn't moving forward in executing and getting the things done that they need to get done, I, I would sort of look at the, the why behind it and understand the reason for it. Um, do they have clear directions? Are they going through things personally at home? Yeah, you mentioned school. I mean, we're all now school teachers pretty much, which wasn't really my ultimate goal in life and my kids are suffering <laughs> for that. So, um, but it's, it's understanding like the, what's happening with people and the reason why things are not moving and then having those direct conversations with them. If you're not doing one-on-ones with your team or, you're, or, they're, or they're not having one-on-ones with their leaders, you're, you're kind of missing the boat. Um, because you really need to understand what's happening with them, both at a, on a business level and on a personal level, because they work hand in hand. And so, you know, the things that affect you at, at home will definitely affect you at work. So you have to clear, understand that. But things could be affecting them at work, too. Um, maybe what they're doing is their goals aren't clear. Maybe what they're doing, they're not, you know, they don't, have, they don't believe in it. And maybe they don't see the whole picture of it. So once it comes back to communication talking to your team, understanding their challenges and what's happening with them. Yeah, and I'll just add to that uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time from Maya Angelou, who said that um, people don't remember uh, what you say, people don't remember what you do, people remember how you make them feel. And in these interesting and difficult times, man, it's our job as leaders to figure out 
how to make people feel good about themselves because that's what really motivates people. Sure, people want money and people want power and people want lots of things, but at the end of, a, of the day, most of the time people just wanna feel good about themselves. Uh, and that may be one of the biggest challenges we face as leaders right now. How do we make people feel good about themselves as we go through a global pandemic and all the challenges mm -hmm. that go along with it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna add on to that, Greg. I think that it even, you know, I want to take a little step further is that we all have the same desire, right? We all have the desire to be seen and known, right? So when, when as a leader, you know, this question said, how do you just get over it, right? I kind of, you know, reeled a little bit as I heard those words in that, you know, telling people just to get over something, that's the fastest way to feel unseen, right? Oh, so you're telling me what I'm feeling isn't, you know, isn't real. Now, that doesn't mean we have to dive into this whole, you know, I, not, we don't all have to be, you know, leaders don't have to be therapists. I get it. No. But to quickly just say, hey, get over it is, is <clears throat> again, a way to not see the people that are part of your team. And, and that's a great, you know, to your point, Greg, you know, that's not a good feeling that you will uh, impart to your teams or your customers or your investors, whoever it is, uh, you know, towards that Maya Angelou, right? What did you, how did you make them feel? Uh, I think that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Let me grab another question. Well, we, next, we actually, got, we, have a, we, have, yeah, we do have a, question. have a question. Oh, great. Um, can we hear more about compassion to current circumstances? Every business we, we work with is bracing for a further market crash, and it's harder than ever to get people to invest in services to improve their businesses when they're struggling to stay open, knowing that I'm, struggle, I'm struggling with the messaging. So what, what, do, what can we hear about, about compassion to current circumstances? How does that look? Hmm. Matthew, uh, such a good question. The three of us are quiet for 10 well, seconds. That's a good you one. You know, <laughs> I, I, I go back to a couple different things that we've talked about. So one was under, having empathy right, and understanding what, that everybody is going through something. Um, there's, a great, uh, there's a great video we show every once in a while, and if you haven't looked at it, it's a, a Chick-fil-A video um, that uh, everybody, it's called Everyone Has a Story. And it, it's good to show your team, and it, it shows uh, walking through a Chick-fil-A uh, restaurant where they kind of highlight some different things that everybody's going to, through and that you would never know. And it, it really kind of hits home when you watch it and understand that everybody has a story and everybody is going through things, right? And so, you know, it's a, um, I was on a call the other day with uh, Jack Daly and something Jack Daly said was, uh, I was a, a sales coach. He said, you know, it's not about selling right now. It's about listening and focusing on listening to what people need. Great time to sell new products, great time to develop new things. But it comes out point is you need to listen and lead with listening, lead with understanding, lead with that empathy and, and create that relationship where they come to you because you're there to listen. Um, there will be a time and it might not be right now that they need exactly what you do. But the, the idea is though, is to stay with them, stay part of them, stay, you know, stay beside them to help them to be there. And it's the same thing you want to do with your team, right? It's, just, it's the exact same thing you want to do with your team. Uh, I would, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go I ahead. would just uh, concur with that. And Stephen Covey said, seek first to understand and then to be understood. That's stayed with me my entire life. It's, a, it's one of the seven habits. Um, and that's a great perspective to have. The, the other thing, piggybacking on what Jason said, is it, to, to me, brands, and cultures are being either built or destroyed in this environment, right? And if you want to make sure that these brands are built, your brand is built, compassion's at the top of the list, and it consists of giving and giving and giving, helping and helping and helping. And if you do that, and you do a really good job of that, and you build deeper, more trusting relationships along the way, at the end of this, you will be rewarded. And I truly believe that. And that doesn't mean you could stick your hand in the sand. You still have to be really smart and on top of things. 
Um, but if you do that, you will be rewarded. So I would concur with Jason that you've, you've got to approach this time with complete compassion, complete server, you know, um, a leader, servant leadership approach. And if you do a really good job at that, um, you'll come out um, better on the other side. Absolutely. Well, and, and I think I, I'm going to kind of riff off of what you're saying. I agree with both of you. Uh, and, and riff off of what you're saying, uh, Greg, because I agree with what Jason, you said earlier, right? Uh, there's no destination of the future, right? And what I mean by that is you're not going to get somewhere and then then it's the results, right? This is a journey. <laughs> this We're all on a journey and your business is on a journey. And it, to, to your point, uh, Greg, is I think that, you know, if we are now is the time to be more in service of people, right? And understanding what their needs are, um, you know, understanding. You know, a year ago, two years ago, <clears throat> things were arguably in a better place. And I think we had the opportunity to, um, you know, communicate with people and, and pe prospects, if you will, of what we were doing. And it was to say, hey, we'd love to get in there. And it was kind of a back and a forth and understanding I agree with Jack Daly, I, you know, the era of quote unquote selling is long past, right? People want relationships and they, they don't want to be sold. They want to be communicated with what the product or service is and how it might help them, right? Uh, lead a better life, deliver a better product or solution. But right now, so answering your, your question, Matthew, is, you know, right now, I think it's about saying, you know, you understand maybe giving a little bit more than uh, you might expect to and expecting a little bit less back in the moment and over time that gets um that that is remembered and people will i agree with you greg is brands are are really built in challenging times we can all build great brands when things are <clears throat> heady and fun and you know and and it's quote unquote easy uh it's when it's tough that the best brands are made you know my grandfather was married i think 65 years and I had a chance to ask him what the key to his success was all that time. Why, how did you stay married for six separate, years? Houses. Se separate houses? <laughs> what he said was really interesting. And I think it pertains to our relationship with our employees, with our relationship with our clients, with our relationship with our vendors. And what he said was give just a little more than you get every single day. I thought that was really interesting. Give just a little more than you get every single day and approach life that way. Um, and I think that, I think it's applicable in today's environment. That's cool. That's good. All right, I got another question here. I, I, I also, I just wanna add one thing on, onto that, which I think is pertinent to Matthew's question too, is that <clears throat> is really especially true right now. People are not expecting that. Right now, everybody's in this kind of, oh, shoot, you know, kind of, you know, pulled back defensive place. And I think we're finding it at Petra. We've done a, a lot of stuff at Petra that's like we did not do a year ago, right? And I mean, things like this. We were not doing Facebook Live, you know, just chatting with people uh, like Matthew and others. But we also knew that we have a unique set of resources and the, you know, we touch a lot of companies. Why not get it out there, right? And people aren't expecting it right now. Do a little bit more. And, um, you know, that, that's a way for you both to be in motion and to do the unexpected, to do that a little bit more. I think uh, that's compassion. Excellent. Matthew, thank you for that question. Uh, hopefully we can get some more from the, uh, from the viewers. Um, I do have another one that changes course a little bit, which is good. So the question You didn't is shake the box up. Come on, Greg. You got to shake the <laughs> box vigorously. So this one says routines have obviously been disrupted, in many cases recreated uh, these last five months. First we had quarantine, then back to work uh, with a different set of rules. Some have done well and some have not. What guidance do you have for us to get back or create healthy, productive routines? Well, I look at right now routines and I think personally, I think a lot of people are, there's a lot of fatigue with their routines. So, you know, think about it this summer, probably everybody used to take a lot of trips during the summer, get away. That might not be happening right now. Um, you know, and so things like that, the change to their, to their life and those routines is really affecting people. And so I think you have to look back and say, you know, the routines that they're currently in, 
are the routines. And those routines are probably going to stay the way it is. And that's the, that's the big thing to stay focused on um, is what those routines look like. What changes can you make to them? How do you, how do you make it a little bit different, right? Don't let people get into a rut. And so if you look, have people look at what they're doing, because I think what happened is when we first kind of shut down, everybody shut down. And the challenge from that is that people then have slowly opened up, but they're kind of getting worn down. And so you have to find ways of doing new energy, bring new excitement, um, bring things back, bring the life back. Um, you kind of talked about, you know, right now, this is a time period where the culture is going to really be built or destroyed. And I think you have to look at it from the standpoint that it's, it's true, your culture might be suffering. And if you're feeling like there's fatigue and people are getting stuck in routines, look at your culture and go back to what was working and, you, and bring that back to life, rejuvenate things. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think, I think you go back to, again, go back to that why, right? You talk about <laughs> what's the, what's the why of the company, right? Why do we exist, right? So uh, building routines, make sure that what you're doing is in alignment with what your core purpose as an organization is. Um, yes, we've had to adapt to, you know, something that was thrown our direction, you know, all at once uh, in, in ways we never expected. But, uh, you know, now is the opportunity to, to really evaluate those things, evaluate what's working and what isn't, and be honest about it. You know, we go back to that compassion part, right? But be compassionate to yourself and the company, right? Be, say, hey, you know what? We adapted in this way. We, you know, we had a hypothesis that it could work. And quite frankly, you know, Jason, I agree with you. We got in a rut. Okay, well, what do we need to do? The goal might still be the same, but maybe we need to go about it in a little different way. Um, the way that I've been talking with, with Y member companies on this is I, I see it a lot both within the member companies we have, but in the greater communities that, that we're a part of and in the entrepreneurs organization and others um, is I think we're kind of have gotten through and we've reached what I call the adrenaline drop phase, which is initially when this hit, we all went into this adrenaline mode of we're going to band together, we're going to make it work, you know, our teams are going to make it work and, you know, we did a lot of things we'd never done before but we're running on this adrenaline energy and we've hit that point of, okay, you cannot sustain that adrenaline, you know, rush level forever. And so our systems are rebelling against that. And Jason, I agree with you. I think what's happened is we've gone to the other side of the extreme, right? We're in one state here and then we went to adrenaline rush and we're over here and we need to figure out where that middle ground is, where we can adapt to the current situations, right? And what's going on and, and, and yes, be a little bit flexible, right? How do I, you know, bob and weave when I need to, but it isn't extremes and we can help people kind of, uh, you know, uh, take a breather, right? Kind of come back and, and I'd add on the routine part of it with this question, work with your team on what routines will work. Don't feel like it's on you as a leader or leadership team to just figure it all out. The teams are in this work with them. Same thing with your customers and your vendors, mm -hmm. asking them, what is it that will help? You know, we've delivered it this way in the past. We, we got really good at that. We believe that's a really good process, but Mr. Customer, if we could do something different, what might we do? They might tell you, you could cut out three things and that might make it easier for you to do it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with both of you. And what I would add is that routines, consistency, discipline, uh, is hard. If, if it was easy, everybody would be great at everything. Everybody would be a great pianist. Everybody would be a great athlete. Everybody would be a great um, uh, long distance uh, runner, or wh whatever it is, but they're not. They're not because, I don't know why I said long distance runner. But if, because, because his daughter is and I don't. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> um, but, but they're not because it's hard. And I do think that a situation like this, an environment that we're in like this, frankly, is an easy excuse, right? It's an excuse to step back from that hard work, that commitment, that dedication. Um, and I mean, for everybody, that includes the three of us co as coaches. Um, yeah. And I, I think yeah. what I would do is, what, and what I would say is I would challenge all of you to find those new routines um, to Mark and Jason's point, find those new routines and disciplines and commit to them more than ever before. 
uh, and challenge your team to do the same. Um, and don't allow this pandemic to be an excuse or distraction from that. Um, allow it to be an opportunity to change some routines, to pivot in some ways that um, you, um, you may not have done prior um, and to recommit. Um, so I think that's- But I, I think you bring up, I do think you bring up a good point though, Greg, which is I think it's important also to understand which routines are serving us. Right. And don't let this be an excuse of, you know, oh, you know, we just didn't kind of like that. All uh, right. Uh, I know, Greg, you use this one often. Right. It's like every basketball professional basketball game you go to, you watch them in warm ups do layups practice. Right. How many layup, you know, layup practices do you think LeBron James has done in his life? And yet every game he's doing a layup practice. Right. That's important. You know, don't just take it out because you're like, oh, well, it's a pandemic, so uh, we can take that out. The routines that are there that are serving us and serving us well as leaders, it's our job to say, you know what, this might not be our favorite thing to do, but it serves us or our customers or our vendors, right, whoever it is, incredibly well, and we need to keep doing that. You know, I, I think of the example, I know you threw it out, Greg, but, uh, you know, my, my daughter doing cross country, uh, you know, Jason, and, and you know, he, he rolls his eyes sometimes, oh, my God, how could you do that? And I'm amazed that she does too, because that isn't what drives me, but she knows that if she goes out and she does the things that she loves, uh, that she gets the results that she wants. And, you know, that's what we have to do as a, as a leader and teams is make sure we don't give up those things that are important. And, and, and find some, some ways to enforce these. Hire a coach, find an accountability partner or an accountability group, um, you know, double down, uh, on these things, um, because now is uh, now is the time to do so. Yeah, I, I still kind of go back to you know I think when everybody was everybody was over here, we all got forced into a new routine, and that routine is just not that comfortable. And you you have to find a way to to adapt that. And come, Mark, you were kind of like we did this and we're doing this, and we got to come back to the middle. And I agree, um, is that we've got to find got to find that happy balance of what is the right routine for you. And look, once again, I go back to, you know, we're, a lot of us now are, are school teachers at home and that becomes a challenge for everybody, you know? So once again, now the routine you were in before now is additionally a challenge, you know? And, and so this is, there's a lot of challenges and you have to look and continue to look at your routine and evaluate what's working, what's not working and make changes to it based on what, what is happening to you. Well, and I think too, as, as you're bring, as you're bringing this out, um, I know you want to maybe go to another question, but I think this is a good one. I really do, Greg. Is that you know, as we're looking at you know these routines, right? Is if we look at them and say, oh gosh, I really wish we could go back to the way it was. I mean, let's use us as an example, the three of us, right? As as coaches, uh, we used to spend a lot of time going out to our members, right? Going out and meeting with the teams and getting in that room. And you know, there's a lot that can be done. There's a lot of um, you know unspoken things in a room that we can gain from and, and help guide and coach an organization. And then we were thrown into going 100% virtual because we had to. Right. Uh, and we could sit here and, you know, as an organization or as individual coaches, we could say, you know, our business of coaching, like, wow, boy, I can't wait till I can get out on the road and just do it all over again. And, and maybe we think a little bit of that, but if we focus on that, that is going to be a kind of a, it's almost like it's a negative in our head. Wow. Mm -hmm. I got to, you know, how do I get back? How do I get back? Um, versus saying, you know what, given where we're at, how can I be, how can I look at it and make it almost a game of what's really cool? What do my customers want? You know, what do these businesses that we coach want and how do we get maybe a little bit of that in the room in the future, right? When we can yeah. get back to it, but you see it as this thing that you're going towards versus going back to something because it just felt comfortable in the past I, as leaders and businesses, you know, whatever your business is, I think if we look at it in that positive light of, Ooh, this is exciting because I can look towards the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that in the past it was really comfortable and you're doing well in your business or whatever. Um, but, you know, we always get tossed these curveballs. It's how you adapt to them and look at them uh, and how the mindset you have going into it, I think that makes a difference. Yeah, I would agree. Sure. sure. All right, I got uh, what well, maybe the last question. We'll see here. Um, I'm not sure there have been too many times in history, if ever, that information was so pervasive. It's like a garden hose that never turns off. How are you seeing leaders successfully manage through that? 
Well, I, th I think a lot of it just depends on what kind of information they're getting. So the one thing I tell every company I work with is turn off the news um, and get down to more source information. So you take out the, the spin and the bias of, of this side or that side, right? So because it's a lot of noise. So find the, find the source information if you're, if you're looking for anything that's really happening in the coronavirus world, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing I'd say. And, but I also think that, you know, because there is so much information, I do think you need to focus on what is going to help you, right? What's going to help you and, and, and where you look at it. So to me, it's about limiting some of those sources, getting people that if somebody recommends who you trust, recommends something to you, that's a direction to go. Um, I would stay focused on the things that you, you were, that were keeping you, your business going and keeping your business successful and stay focused on that kind of information. I think there's too much, there can be too much noise, um, particularly around uh, the, uh, the kind of the health issues that are going on and the, and the social issues that are going on that I think can create more challenges uh, for you in operating your business. I think reading about the economy, I think that's a great thing to know. I think understanding where we're going, and getting a little clearer picture of the economy, I think is important. Anything around your industry, I think is extremely important. Um, those fundamentals that you should be looking at anyway, um, given today's times or, you know, what was back in, what was it, 2015 when this, before this, oh, I guess 2019 <laughs> when this started. <laughs> wow, you went back there, Jason, nice. Well, it's been the longest right, what do you March, think? this has been the longest March yeah. of my life. That's true. <laughs> Mark, any thoughts? Um. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the question said, you know, the, the garden hose of fresh, I, I, I'd say it kind of feels like a fire hydrant hose. I mean, it's like, it feels a lot bigger than the garden hose, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I get every day get, you know, you know, come to my webinar, come to my, you know, this or that, uh, and, and or stories that are coming through. I, I agree fully with what Jason was just saying, which is find your trusted sources. Right. And find those places where you get information that, um, you know, I, I think the art of critically analyzing information that we're getting has been lost, you know, just because it's on the Internet, we believe it. Right. And I think as a leader, one of our jobs is to make sure that we are, you know, critically looking at uh, information and the things that are coming in. And, and we're open to knowing that things might change. But find your trusted sources. And when I say that, I, you know, I'm with you, Jason, is that, you know, for myself, I, I have a handful of people that, you know, I know and trust. If they say an article is good, then I believe that, right? It, it's kind of mm -hmm. it's kind of like your, you know, your, your trusted Amazon, you know, selections, right? How, how can you create that for yourself? If that's, you know, an industry group, uh, if it's, uh, you know, a, a, a group of other business leaders, it could be your college friends. I don't know who it is, but come up with a place where, you know, you can, you know, kind of ping on a regular basis or get pinged and know that that's a trusted source for you and whatever that may be, because there's a lot of noise going on. There's a lot of people that want to be heard. And what I've found to be true in, in my life, both in my business career uh, and just in general is people that are yelling the loudest are usually the ones that have a biggest um, biased reason for doing that. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm getting a lot of messages about this one thing, it's like, okay, I'm looking really hard at why are they screaming so loudly? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, this is a really good question. Um, and it, it, it makes me think about a, a number of different things. Uh, in, in addition to finding those trusted sources, which is critical, I think about how important the, the, this question is. It, 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 it's arguably one of the most important things that as a leader, you need to develop a skill set in. And, and, and I see multiple skills here. It's not just you know, how you collect information. I see, you know, number one, you know, we've got to learn to synthesize information better, right? As leaders, we look at all this information and we can either get consumed by it or we can put it into bullets. We can put it into categories. We can identify the real headlines, not, you know, not necessarily what the news headlines are. Um, we need to be better at synthesizing information. The second thing I think about is prioritization, 
we need to be better at prioritizing information. Mm -hmm. It's easy to put the wrong things at the top because they're urgent as opposed to important. So we need to develop skills that allow the important things to go to the top, to prioritize this information. List making is something that I've used for 25 years uh, that I find really important and really helpful to them. You know, the, the third skill that comes to mind is um, delegation, uh, authorita authoritizing people with what to do with those priorities, right? Simply identifying those priorities doesn't do the job. We now have to delegate and authorize people to do that work. Um, something that often small business leaders are very poor at. How, you know, we, we need to learn to delegate. We need to learn to authorize. And I have a, sh a short story to tell about that in a moment. Um, and then the fourth thing that comes to mind that we do a lousy job is, is, is we need to learn to validate, to verify that that work gets done. I mean, even if we're smart enough to delegate and authorize somebody, often we forget to follow up and make sure that it gets done properly. Um, so those four things come to mind. It's got all this information coming in, and we've got to be better at synthesizing, prioritizing, authorizing, and verifying. And um, um, I remember when I was a young, uh, young CEO, um, this, you're going back 20 plus years now, and I had the good fortune of uh, being interviewed by uh, Bloomberg News uh, on 52nd Street, I believe, in, in Manhattan. And uh, I go into this massive building, uh, and I'm escorted to the makeup room because they're going to put makeup on. It's my first time that ever happened to me before I get on to, to the television. I'm walking through this amazing, amazing building. And um, they take me through the main floor. And on the main floor is this beautiful glass office. It's like in the middle of the hustle and bustle. And I asked them, Who's, what is that? Whose office is that? And they said, that's Michael Bloomberg's office. And I said, really? I said, there's no desk in there. And they said, yes, that's because Michael Bloomberg delegates every single thing that there is to delegate. And at 22, 23, 25 years old, I said to myself, what? How is that possible? And it was just uh, fascinating to me um, to think that everything gets delegated um, uh, from Michael Bloomberg. And I, I want to challenge all of our viewers um, to consider that. Um, you've got to be smart about it. You've got to have follow through. You've got to have good people. Um, mm -hmm. But most of us take on way too much. Um, yeah. and that gets us in trouble. So we got all this information, and then we take on too much on top of that. Um, so learn to delegate better. All right. Any other thoughts, guys? You know, one thing I just say, you know, kind of thinking about from that information standpoint, this is the greatest, this is the best time you're ever going to have to learn. Um, there's a lot of information that's being pushed out. So focus on your learning and your personal growth. Um, go back, read books. All right, there's a lot of things to learn. Read some great information. Uh, McKinsey, Harvard Business Reports. Like all their, there's so many different things that have good information that you really can use and grow from. Very good point. Very good point. All right. Well, uh, on behalf of Mark and Jason and I, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we hope you've uh, uh, learned a few things. We hope you had some actionable takeaways. Uh, and uh, we wish you uh, success on a go forward basis with your businesses and your lives. Uh, I know that we had an announcement or two we wanted to share. Jason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one thing is um, we are actually hiring. Petra is hiring. We're looking for accountability coaches. Um, you can go to our website, petrocoach.com. And there's information on that. Also, we have a workshop uh, tomorrow led by uh, our European coach, uh, Andy Clayton. Um, he wrote a book called Sweet Spot. And it's going to be a great content about how you can uh, how you can kind of do your best, right? What the best looks like, and make sure you're operating in your sweet spot. So it's it's really good content. Fantastic information. And once again, information's on the website. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Best to all. Thanks a lot.